Today's scripture reading from Luke chapter 13 tells a story found only in this gospel of Jesus healing a woman in a synagogue on the Sabbath. I'd like to explain how our reading today is connected to a passage in the fourth chapter of Luke when Jesus is beginning his ministry. Again, he is in a synagogue, this time in his hometown of Nazareth, and he reads these words from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus says to the people, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In this passage, Luke is telling the reader about the kinds of ministry Jesus will engage in throughout this gospel. The connection between this passage and today's is Jesus' ministry of liberation, of proclaiming release to the captives and setting free those who are oppressed. As I read Luke 13, verses 10 to 17, you'll hear the woman's healing referred to as a setting free in two separate verses. I invite you to listen for these words and other phrases that touch your spirit. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things done by him. Before I begin my sermon, I would just like to offer my thanks to my friend Adele, who helped me with some uh, ideas, and I also read several commentaries online, so I give thanks to those writers as well. Let us pray. The peace of morning stillness, the peace of new beginnings, the peace of heaven's kiss to welcome us to this day, to root us in this day, to free us for this day, that we may grow with the greening earth, that we may grow from the ground of glory, that we may grow in grateful wonder of you, gracious giver of this day. Amen. That is a beautiful prayer from John Philip Newell. When my granddaughter was almost three years old, her parents sent out a video to family of her literally bouncing down the walk one morning as she headed towards the car. She was on the way to daycare. In the middle of a bounce, she bent over, picked up an object from the ground, waved it in the air and exclaimed, look, I found a great stick. Her father, wise, wisely agreed and said, yes, that is a great stick. Oh, to be young and so excited about finding a great stick. 
Do you remember as a child lying on your tummy, examining grass, soil, sand, snow, stones, ants, spiders, or crouching down to look at flowers, bees, or mud puddles? It's a wonderful way to learn about the world. But what if that was all you could see? What if, like the woman in the gospel story, you could not stand up straight? What if day after day, all you could see was the dust on the road, people's feet, stones, bugs, and other, peop other people's litter? We don't know if the woman is seeking to be healed when she goes to the synagogue that day. In other gospel stories, people actively seek heal healing, but this woman does not. Or possibly she is waiting until after worship to go to Jesus and ask to be healed. But that's not how it goes. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue, and at some point he notices the woman stops teaching and calls her over. I wonder how she feels in that moment, maybe mortified because she doesn't want to be the center of attention. Or maybe she feels hopeful, for surely she has heard stories of Jesus healing others. Perhaps someone guides her over to Jesus, since being bent over, she wouldn't be able to see where he was. As she goes to him, she sp he speaks words of healing. Woman, you are set free from your ailment. However, it is only when he touches her that she stands up straight. Jesus heals by word and by touch. I like to imagine that as she stands tall for the first time in years, the first thing she chooses to look at is Jesus' kind face. And then she begins to praise the Creator. Hallelujah! Thanks be to God. And what might she have gazed at as she made her way home from the synagogue? The sky, the clouds, the treetops, the hills off in the distance. What a wonderful gift Jesus has given her the freedom to look around and see the world. This sermon is entitled, Perceiving and Believing. I like words and learning where they come from. To perceive is from two Latin words that mean to grasp thoroughly. We human beings can perceive things with our senses, our mind, our heart, our intuition. These different ways of perceiving mean that when we perceive something, we can notice it or understand it or have a new realization about it. And at its root, to believe means to hold dear or valuable, to love. I quite like what Kathleen Norris writes about belief in her book, Amazing Grace. She writes, I find it sad to consider that belief has become a scary word because at its Greek root, to believe simply means to give one's heart to. Thus, if we can determine what it is we give our heart to, then we will know what it is we believe. I believe in Creator God can mean I give my heart to Creator God. What Nora says certainly seems to hold true in this statement. In order to see and learn about the world, we need to look closely at little things, like ladybugs crawling along a blade of grass. And we also need to take in the long, wide view to notice the lake, the mountains, the sky, it is similar when we are perceiving something in the sense of gaining a new understanding or realization. We need to consider both the small details and the bigger picture, or our view can be limited or even distorted. It is good to approach things with an open mind and heart, willing to hear and consider all sides of a story, 
for our perceiving can affect our believing. I've been reflecting on how the woman's visual perception before and after the healing experience may have differed. Perhaps the events of that day also give her a new understanding or realization of herself and her relationship to and with God. What might her reaction be when she hears Jesus respond to the leader of the synagogue who is all bent out of shape over Jesus healing on the Sabbath? Jesus names her a daughter of Abraham and declares that she is worthy of being set free from her ailment. It's not the healing that has made her so, She's always been a daughter of Abraham and worthy of God's love and care, despite what other people might have thought or might have called her. But chances are that Jesus' affirmation and his act of healing change her perception of herself and help her believe in her own value. And believing in one's own worth can empower a person to accomplish many good things, things that improve one's own life and the lives of others. Our perceiving can affect our believing. As an aside here, I wonder why the story isn't known as the story of a daughter of Abraham rather than the story of a bent-over woman, since no other woman in the four Gospels is referred to by Jesus as a daughter of Abraham. And what about the leader of the synagogue? Is it possible his perceiving and believing were affected by what took place that day? When he indignantly declares to the congregation, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. He is referring to a law of Moses. <clears throat> In the book of Deuteronomy, the law says the Sabbath is to be kept holy because this is what God has commanded. No one is to do any work, not even the servants, not even livestock. However, we understand from Jesus' response to the synagogue leader that people are allowed to untie an ox or a donkey and lead it to water on the Sabbath. This is not considered work because the needs of the animals are simply being met. Using this image of being bound and then untied, Jesus argues for the right to help the woman. He says, and ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? One commentator, Ian Paul, explains that Jesus argues here from the lesser to the greater. If a person is prepared to offer Sabbath rest to their animals, surely they cannot withhold this from a human being. Sabbath means rest and liberation for all creatures. Jesus' argument is so effective that the leader of the synagogue and anyone else who opposed him that day are put to shame. In the Roman world, the, sister, the system of honor and shame played a significant role. It kept people in their so-called proper place. At the beginning of the story, the woman, because of her physical condition, would have been considered an object of shame by others in the congregation. And the leader of the synagogue, a person with authority, would have held a place of honor. Now at the close of the story, we hear of the reversal. All Jesus' opponents are put to shame, and the entire crowd rejoices at all the wonderful things being done by him. And this, of course, includes the healing of the woman. It would take a great deal of eating humble pie but it's not out of the realm of possibility that the leader may have gone home and reflected on Jesus' words and actions. Perhaps his perception of what God truly desires for people changed and thus affected his beliefs. 
Just maybe he was also healed that day and was set free from a binding interpretation of God's word. Perhaps this marked the beginning of his believing in a loving, liberating God who longs for wholeness and health for all creatures. This story from today's gospel invites us to think about how we are feeling afflicted and bent over. Surely the news continues to weigh on us. We hear of more and more tragic situations every time we tune in, and we are sad and worried at the state of the world. And as a congregation, we are feeling the weight of the deaths of people dear to us. Many of them attended worship regularly up until the pandemic began. All deaths are significant, of course, some of you have lost loved ones who were not part of this congregation, and these losses distress and sadden us as well. Each person lost can be a reminder of other people we have known who are no longer here with us, and so often our grief is multiplied layer upon layer. Yet during a funeral service, we declare that far greater than the power of pain and death is the power of life and love. We want to believe that all the beauty and wonder, goodness and love in the world outweigh all the sorrow and stress, war and devastation. But sometimes it does feel like an uphill battle. Since our perceiving can affect our believing, these are the times when we need to shift our perception. We need to strive for some sense of balance between all that feels wrong and all that feels right. The terrible and incomprehensible being held in balance with beauty and wonder. What helps you on days when you feel overwhelmed and seek some healing? For me, noticing anything that makes me catch my breath and exclaim, wow, helps my perspective. Paying attention to the good news is most encouraging. For example, last Friday I was celebrating when I heard that the person newly appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada is Michelle Obonsuan, the first Indigenous person to serve in this way. As the only Indigenous judge, she will bring a new perspective to the Supreme Court at, at a time when it is greatly needed to help this country work on the calls to action offered by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. All forms of music and art, along with surrounding myself with kind, thoughtful, respectful people, these things work wonders as does being in the church kitchen, as all of you who are committed to the Meals of Hope ministry joyfully chop and cook and care. Participating in any action where, where we are giving of ourselves to help others often helps us to perceive God's goodness and to believe that, yes, this may be a wounded world, yet it is full of love and beauty and wonder. When we take part in liberating actions, we too are set free. Stepping out into nature is, a, is another powerful antidote to my feeling well, weighed down and bent out of shape. Later today, when I head out for my daily walk, I may not bend over and pick up a great stick but I just might lean on a great tree trunk and whisper, thank you. Let us pray. And this is a verse from a well-known hymn, Open My Eyes. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. 
Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. May it be so. Amen.